Hello. Today we are going to be talking about making your documentation SEO friendly and what it entails. My name is Miriam Gessier, and uh, as you can hear it, I have a French accent. There's a good reason for that. I'm currently based in Quebec, Canada, well, Montreal city to be exact. And I'm here today because I really like messing with algorithms that rank content according to arcane criteria I may or may not agree with. And um, I turned this into my job. It used to be a hobby. So if you ever need somebody like this, give me a shout out. I really take the time to answer any questions um, people have on social media, because if I can help, let's do it. So without further ado, let's get started with this SEO thing. The first thing you have to keep in mind when we are talking about search engine optimization is that you have to write with intent. You have to take into account what people are intending to find, but you also have to write with the intention of making your content easily discoverable online. This means that first and foremost, you have to take the time to understand search behavior. Any search online starts with a desire. And this desire, aka what's in our heads, we transpose it into the real world through a search bar. So how does this get transposed? Through a query. This query comes with expectations of value. We have expectations because we transpose what was in our heads into the search bar, we expect a certain type of result. So value is measured against an internal criteria for acceptance that your users have and that you may not be aware if you do not take the time to understand it. People simultaneously process acceptance and rejection criteria for every result that they check on the search engine result page. So in our business, we call that a SERP because search engine result page gets very tiring. Hence the explanation. So that means you have one shot at getting the attention and that click to your documentation. So what is documentation for a marketer? Well, to me, it means a few things. It means that if you take the time to develop a robust documentation that is available online, it's where your future customers learn about your services. It's also where they go instead of opening a ticket. So that means they don't have to sit and wait for a service rep to answer them. This is pretty good marketing because it doesn't entail showy ads. It doesn't entail strategies to, you know, get your content out there and seen by everybody. It is more of a pull. We're waiting for people to ask questions about these things and we are here to answer them. So let's look at what search intent means. If your pages contain useful information, according to Google, their content, their content will attract visitors. And that's great, but it's pretty nebulous. What does it mean? Well, useful information entails you giving your customers access to instant, in-depth information they need, things that they are seeking. There's nothing more frustrating than trying to figure out if a product is right or how to fix a problem with a product and not find it through Google because the knowledge base is not available online. You have to log in. This makes things much harder. So ask yourself, okay, what do people seek at every step of the way and can we provide it for them? Because most of the time, a customer journey will start with wondering, is this compatible to what I have? Is this good with the stack that I have? Google provides detailed instructions that I have linked in this presentation, if you want to take the time to read them, on a how to make content easily discoverable. They even share their internal guidelines for content evaluation because they pay specialists, humans, to sit and sift through 
the content on websites. Why? Well, because their algorithm is not perfect. However, the guidelines I have linked really do go in depth as to where Google would like to be um, autonomously with the algorithm without having to have these quality raters, these humans going through websites to give feedback to uh, the machines. So this makes things a bit weird, doesn't it? We are talking about humans that tend to see your content as shown by bots. So you have to think about bots the way they think about humans. Bots become part of your audience. And how do we integrate that? Well, the first piece of advice that I would have for you is create an immediate perception of value of your content through titles, metadata, and microdata. So, what does it mean concretely? Well, it means that you have to work on the title. The title being the little thing that shows up here that may or may not be the official title of your document, depending on how you handle this with your CMS or any solution that you have. The other thing is the description. Google will rewrite the description if it does not like what you have provided. So this makes it very problematic to convince people that, yes, this is what you're looking for. And the last element is work on how it appears. Those recipes, those first three recipes up there, they did not make it on there without the help of a developer thinking about how this data would show up, what the experience would be. So how do we get started with all of this beyond copywriting? Well, here are some best practices that SEO experts put into uh, action to achieve results. Optimize your meta tags, title, and description, as I have stated previously. Create search engine friendly URLs. 0001.html does not speak to anybody. However, if you can place some keywords that people would be looking for in your URL, that may help. So please take that into account. It is read by bots and also humans like me. Implement structured uh, data. So this uh, you can check out. Uh, Google has many, many rich snippets, I think more than 200, that you can implement to make sure that your results pop in search engine result pages. So I would recommend going with the FAQ or the tutorial one to get started. Adding internal links will help you because bots can discover your content more easily and humans as well. And optimizing your media, so the content that is not really text also helps out. If you want to address technical SEO, because there is content SEO and there is technical SEO, I would recommend going with making sure your documentation loads fast and is mobile friendly, making sure the bot can crawl it, that it's secure, because that's a big giveaway for uh, search engines that the content may not be trustworthy. Submit a uh, file that will let Google know these are the pages in my documentation. If you have multilingual support, make sure that you get those um, hreflang tags squared away because this will give information as well as to whether the Spanish version should show up or um, Spanish uh, Google or Mexican uh, versions of Google and deal with duplicate content because if Google sees two contents that are the same, it dilutes the value because Google doesn't know which one to rank first. And if you must kill your content or move it away, handle it with 301 errors, uh, redirections, sorry. Content hierarchy also matters. And it's a technical part that impacts your content because originally content hierarchy, H1, H2, H3 tags used to belong to newspaper, uh, newspapers and printing um, industries. Now it's been brought onto the web. You can quickly check your hierarchy of any website using the link I have provided. So the backdrop here is an extension that you can use on Firefox or Chrome to quickly see how your content is organized according to how search engines would look at it, the H1, H2, H3. Please don't skip any levels because otherwise the bot will think you have missed something. Internal linking, as I have said, it gives a lot of information to bots. You have external links and you have internal links. This report that is pictured here is available for free in a tool called 
Google Search Console that gives you a lot of information about your website. So if you get it hooked up with your website, prove to Google that you own this domain, it will give you information about your top linked pages internally and externally. So you can see which documentation um, articles are getting a bit more algorithmic love than others. So you can, you know, counteract this by consciously choosing to include links in your other documentation that point back to other relevant articles that you're trying to boost. Images should also be um, taken into account, as I've said, the other media available. So I would recommend that you work on titles and alt attributes. But if you have one to choose, I would recommend making sure that you have good copy for the um, alt attribute. It is used um, in the stead of the image. So if Google doesn't have information on what the image contains or if the image is just broken, well, this still helps SEO no matter what. Um, image titles are more of a supplement, a nice to have. And before you say that, uh, it's really hard to get visuals in um, our field. Diagrams are awesome to get traffic, awesome, because it's a visual way of explaining something that your article will go you know, into deeper details. So people will get hooked on the image, find it online because they're trying to understand this and then get onto your page. Um, as I've said previously, rich snippets are really nice to have. So structuring the information that shows up uh, is important. I would also recommend trying to go for the uh, screenshot that you have here. You can install a search bar in the results directly, which means that no other competitor is getting that visibility once that search bar is used. All the results will come from you. But are these results readable? Well, make sure it is. I'm recommending you use a tool called Hemingway App, but there's a few to make sure that it's easy to understand for humans, but also for robots. Robots have a harder time understanding context. So please keep that readability level a bit lower than you normally would. And if you want to show up, in those little answer boxes to get maximum visibility because those boxes, those results are not usually number one underneath. They're coming from way lower on the list. So this is great. It's a great way to show up. And make sure that you format with bullet points or lists to show up when somebody asks a question, whether it be in the search bar or via OK Google. This helps with vocal search as well. Now that's nice. I gave you a lot of advice, but what are people trying to figure out about your product? That's what you should be writing about. And this is something that SEO can help with. The first piece of advice I've, I have for this is, well, go to Google and Google yourself. So type in your product name. If your product name is too generic, put it in quotes. So Google will know to look specifically for that series, that configuration of words, and then how to and then you remove, so minus site, and then you put in your domain name. So Google will search for everything it has on your product and questions that are asked about it, but not on your website. So you get to see what everyone else is talking about that you may not be paying attention to. Check Google Analytics and Google Search Console for extra data. So. I have mentioned Google Search Console as a free tool. Google Analytics is another one. If you have it in, uh, installed, you can get a lot of insights on uh, regarding which pages rank well and which pages bring you traffic and conversions. So if you don't care about the metrics I have just quoted, ask yourself which keywords and content drive the most engagement and look for specific keywords. You can navigate them really easily. You have popular but vague keywords. So these are your high frequency and low intent keywords. They have lots of ambiguity. They're top of the funnel. If I'm looking for the word toaster, I may want to buy one, see a picture of one, read the history of the toaster on Wikipedia. But then you have rare but specific keywords. So those lower frequency, less people search for them, but the intent is higher. There's no ambiguity. So if I am looking for a Google Analytics alternative, you know that I'm already in the middle of the funnel. 
I'm looking for something that is beyond just a generic query. I'm, lo I'm looking for something specific that answers a need that I have. And then you have also long tail keywords. So anything that has three plus words as a query will show strong intent. If I am looking for a um, beautiful women's cocktail dress, or sleeveless cocktail dress, you know I'm being specific about what I want. And then you have those one-off queries that are very rare, like unicorns, or they're a one-time trend, or they, you know, they just pop out once in a while, and they work quite well. So pay attention to these, but don't be too worried about their performance. Just some keywords, some queries are meant to bring in that one client once in a while, and that's it. And there's also keyword modifiers. If you see how to in the keyword, you know it's a tutorial you have to produce. If you see your product plus integration with another product, so for example, Google Analytics plus MailChimp or WordPress and MailChimp, you know what people are trying to do. They say, I already have this. I'm wondering if your solution plugs into what I have. And if you see anything regarding updates, well, Either it's a tutorial on how to do the update or it's an FAQ page that answers some common worries that people have about updating or doing anything that entails some type of decision to level up. Content opportunities are limitless, even for a boring industry. Once you figure out what people want and you know how to interpret it, it's very easy to produce documentation that, it, that will rank well in Google. Last but not least regarding this, it's not just about keywords. Google uses BERT. It's a technique for natural language processing that they developed to be able to help their bots understand the content and the context it's provided in better. So some points to get you started figuring this out. What questions are users asking? Check the frequently asked questions in Google search results, the autocomplete or at the bottom. Um, what issues are customers having with your product? Do you have that knowledge internally? Check the help desk or read transcripts. How does your product compare to other products? A lot of people are doing those versus queries. So product versus other product. What new features are you adding? This is also something that you can dig into. Um, what are the features that users don't know about? This is something you can go with. Integrations with other tools, as I've mentioned, is good. What is the history of your product? That's another good one. If you can tell your story and rank well on Google with that, this is great. And then you can also audit your competition and reverse engineer their content strategy based on the keywords that they rank for and the types of content they rank for. Please do not copy paste. As you see in this screenshot, Google will remove anything it sees as duplicate content. So you will not be able to get more traffic with just a simple copy paste. The content has to be unique and pertinent. And the way to give proper um, signals to Google regarding your content is clustering your topics. So if you are a master at a topic, you would have a pillar page, a hub page that explains what is whatever topic you want to talk about. And then you have articles that go in depth and describe all the little niche or edge cases that will point to your hub. This is a very strong signal for search engines that, ooh, something is at hand, we have an expert on our hands. And this helps them figure out, okay, we can rank the big hub page and we will show the other ones as little site links or just know that, okay, this one, uh, that website, that entity, it knows what it's talking about. Some sources to go further, if you would like to know more about uh, knowledge base SEO, uh, I try to make this very specific and I have quoted some things that you may look into and that could be useful. Thank you very much. To all the people coming in, this is me presenting my pet and now uh, pet will go back to bed. So tired. And we're gonna so to, Yes. This dog is very active whenever we decide that we need to work. Yes. All right, really quickly before we dive into the, you know, serious SEO questions, um, the question on everyone's mind is, what is a cheese bomb and do you have a recipe? A cheese yeah. bomb? 
Well, it depends. Like I, okay, so I have many, many opinions about cheese because I am French. And if you provide me context, I can go off in any direction. But the first thing I want to answer is, <sighs> cheese is like makeup. So you have YouTube videos that explain to you that you need this specific shade, but you can mix these two shades and do something. So whenever I prepare anything cheese related, I'm like, I'm in North America. How can I recreate the French cheese? I should mix this and this, and maybe we can get it. And at some point I've created many, many things like this. So Amazing. I love it. I wouldn't even have thought of that. So very impressive. I if, if you have any cheese questions, I am originally French. We are known to have something here. <laughs> Amazing. But okay, probably uh, for the sake of the conference, we should talk about SEO instead of cheese. <laughs> I, see, I see Julien Gatelier. I think we are a team yes. fromage. But let's get on with uh, it. I see everyone's team cheese. Well, now we're going to be team SEO. Hashtag. But um, okay, first question is, how do you convince decision makers to invest in SEO or at least like improving your SEO if you can't back up that argument with data because you might not have enough of it or haven't started collecting it yet? So this is actually one of the tricky ones and I'm going to be very transparent with you and I'm getting distracted because the cheese theme <laughs> social event sounds amazing. But um, when I got started, I'm going to be very honest. My bosses were like, cool, so you do social media, and I'm like, no. And they're like, awesome, we're number one in Google. I'm like, it doesn't matter if we're number one if we're not getting that traffic, and it's actually not having an impact on people's lives. And I mean, internally, the company, but also externally, the clients and potential clients. So one of the first things that I start with um, SEO, when like you can attack it from a content standpoint or from a technical standpoint. The technical standpoint is very easy. If you pick in Google Analytics, and if you don't have this data, you can use um, Google PageSpeed Insights, but you go, okay, this is the number one page that we think is the most important or the one that drives the most traffic. And look, it's the slowest one. And you can do whatever you want, but you're not going to show up in mobile results as well because you will be penalized if you're not fast, if you don't fill that requirement, you're not shown, your visibility gets shot. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, nothing hurts as bad as a screenshot of a Google um, search engine page results going, we're not there. Or, hey, it's our own brand, but we don't even answer the question because Stack Overflow is number one on this and we should be owning this conversation. So usually it depends on the person you're talking to, but find where it hurts for them and show them literally what happens, what a user goes through. I love that and I think it's, I mean, this is a little bit of my own opinion, but I think it's kind of amazing how much convincing it takes to get people, like especially some developers to really take this topic seriously. So I like the- Yes, it's insane. It ends, I see that Carl made a comment about dig deeper into BERT and most people don't even know what BERT is. So it's, it's a, um, we're talking about keywords and we're talking about, you know, trying it long, et cetera. And Google is over there trying to read our content, understand the context, understand how it's been written, how it relates and how much better it is than the rest of the content that's been published online that talks about the same exact thing. So I, I'm left in a situation where people ask me to do things that we used to do in 2004 and now machines are actually getting better and better at understanding what we want. So a concrete example of unexpected things that happen when machines start to learn from our content is that, for example, uh, I don't know who in the chat here loves Betty White, but I love Betty White. I think Betty White is a treasure. <laughs> and when machine learning started onboarding in Google search results, one of the biggest questions in the most asked section was, is Betty White older than sliced bread? Really? Well, dang it, she is. A, she is. B, I thought it was amazing that machines would go, hey, humans really care about this bit. We should know about this. And that's the magic of this. Like machines bring added rigor, but they also bring this whimsical side that understands us, speaks to us. And I think documentation should be the same. Um, I'm going to finish this on this note. Did you know that um, Google is now able to just highlight bits of a text? So when you're searching for something highly specific and your documentation is the only thing that 
really properly answers it, but it answers it at the end. This used to be an issue for search engines. They used to place more um, importance on the top, on things that are said at the start. And now Google can literally take you highlighting the part that is useful in your content. That's bonkers to me. I love it. As an ex librarian, it's amazing. And if we don't actually try to do these things for users, they, the machines can't pick up and actually show it to other users. Like it has to be there. It has to come from our writing. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. Okay. So yeah, uh, just like that, we have gone into Betty White land. This is amazing. amazing. But okay, since we were talking about writing for humans versus machines, um, one question we got was, uh, can content reuse damage your SEO? Because sometimes that can be a generally good practice in documentation, but maybe not in SEO. Tell us more. I am absolutely loving this question because yes. So when I answer when I, when I entered SEO, <clears throat> I became a technical SEO. So if you have issues with the technical side, you call me up. That's what I'm known for. But what most people don't know is that I come from a copywriting background. I have a communications degree, and back then nobody wanted to pay for content. And you can steal it, copy paste. It's that easy. And then Google introduced. Um, this notion that you couldn't have copy paste. So now if you go actually at the end of uh, search results, Google will tell you like we have excluded 300 results from this because they're the same, they're copy paste. So it's a complicated situation where A, we don't, we don't advise you to reuse content as is. And if you're going to reuse it, um, quote where it's from, or make sure that you remix it. So if you if you say the same thing but in a different order, so what I like to do when you're forced sometimes to have duplicate content, is you take the last paragraph, you put it on top, and you rework your content from there. Like you change the perspective. But another thing is if you're stuck and you don't have a choice, then you should tell Google, hey, these are copies and it can be from different websites. Okay? So if somebody takes your content and you have this bit of code in there that's called a canonical tag. Google will know that this person copied it and that you're the canon, you are the original. So Google will go, okay, I'm showing you. Same for your own website. If you reuse this content and you decide that your documentation should be the first to show, but it's also reused in a landing page for marketing reasons, well, the marketing can maybe use this for the ads, but there's a canonical tag that says, hey, the original is a documentation. So there, you fix that pro problem, quote unquote. But I see some, of, some people may question the other thing. What if we reuse content that's not written? What if it's an image? Mm -hmm. This one is a tricky one because stock photos and you know B2B diagrams explaining complicated topics are very popular and reused online. Yeah. So what you do is Google is actually able to understand that it's a copy, but it encourages it in that time. It goes, huh, that means the image is popular. So then you, you actually get a boost from this. So it's unfair. Not all content is treated the same. So Content as text, a canonical tag. An image, just make sure your brand is in there or that it's attributed to you. You publish it on your website first before you share it on Unsplash or other um, sharing platforms. So, yes. Uh, what I love about all of your answers is that you've given us like a piece that every person can do. Like, even if you're maybe not in control of the code or if you're, you know, someone who's in control of the code but not the content, like, we all can have a piece in this SEO. And I think that is really great. Because there's three pillars and that's what I love about it. It's not a nature versus nurture debate. There's not a for or against. If you're stuck somewhere, overcome that thing with the other lever that you have. So it can be content, it can be reputation. So who says what about your documentation out, out there? And the third one is code. So if your code sucks and you're really stuck, try to get creative on the two other um, channels that you have. And yeah, that, I, I think my job is basically explaining to others how to do it and uh, helping them integrate into it. I don't want to hold my knowledge. SEO is not for that. It's for visibility. So. Yeah, for sure. And then because we're running out of time, I just want to ask you where, like, are you going to publish your slides? And also you have a way for people to get in touch with you, right? Yes. Yes. So I am going to publish my slides. So that is one thing you should know if you have any questions for me. So I felt very, very bad about um, not being able to cover everything I wanted to cover. And I know that my job is a bit tricky because people don't always trust um, search engine um, optimization content or experts for very good reasons because it's a very moving industry. So um, I have shared in the chat, but it can be um, reshared here. I have a Calendly setup. So basically it's
Glory, you have a question for me? Book it, it's free, I promise, no marketing. I just really, really want to help people and have an impact. So if you're interested by what I do, or you want to improve your content for bots and humans, well, make an appointment with me. <laughs> That's amazing. That is like, I just want to emphasize to everyone that is you being really generous with your time on such an important topic that not a lot of people are experts in. So Thank take advantage you so of it. much. It's just, you know, this virtual world is a bit unusual and we're trying to navigate it all the way we can. And with my personality, I think that the Calendly is the perfect way to go about it. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Miriam, for being with us. I really appreciate it. And uh, you know what? Uh, thank you. I see all the claps. So thank you very much. And if you speak Hungarian, this is just an ad. Like I'm lonely over here in Canada and I can't practice with anyone. And I used to only talk to my grandma. So I see some Hungarian names. Pay me. <laughs> oh my gosh. I folks too and everybody else too. Okay. Well, talk soon.